In the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, just north of the Hawaiian Islands, lies a distributing monument to our modern world, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Created by the convergence of the North Pacific gyre and other ocean currents, the patch stretches over 1.6 million square kilometers, an area three times the size of France, and is estimated to contain some 80,000 tons of plastic, ranging in size from a few centimeters down to microscopic particles. And it is not alone. So far, scientists have identified three other major garbage patches in the South Pacific, North Atlantic, and the Central Indian Ocean. The sudden appearance of microplastics in the geological record will be used to mark the start of an Anthropocene, the epoch where humans began having significant impact on the global environment. This is especially impressive and frightening given that plastics as we recognize them today have only existed for around 120 years, and large-scale plastic manufacturing for only around 80 years. But what even is plastic? Who first came up with this endlessly versatile material, and how did it come to dominate and threaten our modern world? Well, let's find out, shall we? The term plastic far predates the material we commonly associate with it today, deriving from the Greek verb plasin, meaning to mold or shape. This sense of plastic persists to this day in terms such as neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to adapt to trauma and other change, and plastic surgery, which contrary to popular belief has nothing to do with silicone or other synthetic fillers. Today, however, the term plastic is generally used to refer to polymers, giant molecules made up of long chains of simpler elements called monomers. Polymers are found everywhere in the natural world, from the DNA that makes up our genetic code to materials humans have used for thousands of years, like cellulose and lignin in wood, cotton, and linen, keratin in animal hair and horn, and isoprene in natural latex. Given the abundance of polymers in nature, it is perhaps unsurprising that the first man-made polymers were derived from these natural materials. Arguably, the first such semi-synthetic material was vulcanized rubber, also known as vulcanite or ebonite. While natural latex rubber has been harvested for centuries, this material gets soft and is sticky in warm weather and hard and brittle in cold, making it unsuited to a wide variety of applications. However, in 1839, a self-taught American inventor named Charles Goodyear made an accidental breakthrough. Goodyear had been working on the problem of stabilizing rubber for five years, the effort draining his resources to the point that he was forced to sell off his home and furniture and set up a makeshift lavatory in a drugstore attic. Every combination of additives Goodyear tried failed, until one day he accidentally spilled a mixture of latex and sulfur on a hot stove. Instead of burning, the mixture solidified and became stable over a wide range of temperatures. From this discovery, Goodyear perfected and patented a process he called vulcanization, which finally allowed rubber to become a viable industrial material. Unfortunately, due to a series of patent disputes, Goodyear never benefited financially from his invention and died penniless in 1860, the company that bears his name to this day not being founded until 1898. Today we know that vulcanization works by creating cross-links between the chains of isoprene in the rubber, preventing these chains from loosening in high temperatures. The late 19th century saw the development of many semi-synthetic plastics based on natural materials, including animal blood. As the ranching and meatpacking industries grew ever larger, slaughterhouse found themselves with a rather sticky problem. What to do with the thousands and thousands of gallons of waste blood they generated daily? When cities banned them from dumping this blood directly into sewers to avoid attracting rats, slaughterhouses tried selling it to sugar mills, soap makers, or to farmers as fertilizers. But even this barely put a dent in the supply of blood. Then in the 1880s, an American inventor, ironically named Dr. W.H. Dribble, found an unusual solution to the problem. He mixed the blood with sawdust or waste cellulose and subjected it to pressures of 280 megapascals, as you do, to produce a new dark brown material he called hemocyte from the Greek hymus, or blood. Hemocyte was durable, resistant to heat and moisture, could be molded into nearly any shape, and took polish well. This was consequently used to make a wide variety of consumer products from jewelry to doorknobs, picture frames, and even roller skate wheels. But like many inventors, Dribble did not invent hemocyte from scratch, but rather simply perfected an earlier invention called Boy's Dursey, or hardened wood, developed by French inventor Francois Lepage in 1855. However, LePage's invention failed to catch on, while Dribble continued to produce hemocyte products into the early 20th century, when the material was eclipsed by more modern plastics like bakelite. Another popular semi-synthetic plastic developed during this era was gallolith, or aranoid, made by treating casein, protein derived from milk, with formaldehyde. Gallolith, derived from the Greek for milkstone, was discovered in 1897 by German printer William Krisch, 
who is trying to develop a hard white writing surface to replace blackboards, slates, and paper in classrooms. While his discovery proved unsuited to its original purpose, it soon found widespread use in the manufacture of small objects like buttons, cigarette holders, piano keys, with world production reaching 10,000 tons by the 1930s. While almost forgotten today, Galileth played a key role in a major fashion revolution. In 1926, legendary French fashion designer Gabriel Coco Chanel introduced the iconic little black dress, a simple and endlessly versatile garment that could be worn by women of all social classes. As the minimalist dress did not lend itself to elaborate jewelry of past decades, Chanel instead accessorized it with inexpensive but bold costume jewelry made of Galilith, sparking a global trend. But while Galileth was cheap and easy to manufacture, large pieces tended to warp severely, meaning its use was mainly restricted to small items like buttons. Indeed, despite there now being hundreds of more modern plastics available, Galileth buttons are still produced in limited quantities, especially in countries with an abundance of milk supplies. However, most historians pin the start of the modern plastics era at the year 1868, and the surprising object that sparked this materials revolution? The humble billiard ball. In the mid-19th century, the game of billiards took the United States by storm, with tables popping up in every saloon and respectable home parlor. Unfortunately, billiard balls were made of ivory, the demand of which quickly pushed elephants to the brink of extinction. In response to this crisis, New York billiard ball manufacturer Felon and Colander offered a $10,000 prize to anyone who could produce a suitable synthetic substitute for ivory. The challenge was taken up by an Albany-based inventor, John Wesley Hyatt, who began experimenting with a substance known as collodion. Collodion was composed of nitrocellulose, cotton which had been treated with nitric and sulfuric acid, dissolved in ether and alcohol, and was widely used in early photography and as a kind of liquid bandage. Hyatt discovered that mixing collodion with camphor, a waxy substance derived from certain plants, yielded a shiny white substance that could easily be heat molded into all sorts of useful shapes. He dubbed his creation celluloid. Like W.H. Dribble with Hamasite, however, Hyatt was only building on the work of earlier inventors. In this case, British metallurgist Alexander Parks, who created a similar material, modestly named Parkesine, in 1855. But while Parks exhibited a variety of Parkesine goods in the 1862 London International Exhibition and established a factory to manufacture the material, spiraling construction costs bankrupted the company and he saw no profits from his invention. In contrast, in 1868, John Hyatt and his brother Isaiah formed the Albany billiard ball company to manufacture natural billiard balls and other goods from celluloid. Yet despite having been specifically created for this application, the new material proved ill-suited for making billiard balls. Celluloid balls behaved very differently to the ivory balls they were meant to replace and made a loud crack whenever they collided, prompting one Colorado saloon keeper to report that, I don't mind, but every time the balls collide, every man in the room pulls a gun. Nonetheless, celluloid soon found a myriad of other uses, replacing not only ivory, but tortoiseshell, coral, ebony, and other rare and expensive natural materials in all manner of household goods, including combs, jewelry, shirt collars, pen barrels, toys, and musical instruments. Hyatt extolled his product as the savior of animals and a force for the democratization of consumer goods. His company advertisements stating, As petroleum came to the relief of the whale, so has celluloid given the elephant, the tortoise, and the coral insect a respite in their native haunts. And it will no longer be necessary to ransack the earth in pursuit of substances which are constantly growing scarcer. But perhaps the most famous use of celluloid was in the manufacture of flexible photographic and cinema film, so much so that today the word celluloid has become a byword for the movies. Ironically, the explosion of popular cinema made possible by celluloid caused one market for celluloid to nearly dry up while simultaneously creating another. In 1914, American ballroom dancer and movie star Irene Castle cut her hair to a short bob, starting a nationwide craze and causing the market for celluloid combs to crash. But while many comb factories were forced to shut down, the Foster Grant Company decided to change with the times and pivot to a different product. In this case, starting to make sunglasses. Thanks to a clever marketing campaign featuring shades wearing movie stars and the slogan, Who's Behind These Foster Grants? The company succeeded in staying afloat and creating a new fashion staple in the process.
Yet for all its versatility, celluloid suffered from a number of serious flaws. For example, as a thermoplastic, it deformed easily under excessive heat. Also, being based on nitrocellulose, a volatile explosive, celluloid also had the unfortunate habit of spontaneously bursting into flames. Consequently, fires in cinemas and film vaults were a common occurrence, resulting in an estimated 90% of American films made before 1929 being lost forever. This problem was largely solved by the introduction of a similar polymer called cellulose acetate, which was considerably less flammable. By the 1950s, acetate safety film had largely replaced celluloid in mainstream filmmaking. Other cellulose-derived polymers developed during this era include rayon or viscous, developed by English chemist Charles Cross, Edward Bevan, and Clayton Beadle in 1894 as a synthetic substitute for silk, and cellophane created by Swiss chemist Jock Brandeberger in 1912 and used as water and moisture-proof wrapping material for food, flowers, and other products. But the first truly synthetic plastic, that is, the first to be made entirely from coal or petroleum-derived ingredients, was the aforementioned Bakelite, patented by American inventor Leo Bakelite in 1909. Bakelite had been searching for a substitute for shellac, a hard varnish-like material made from the secretions of the lac insect for use as an insulator in electrical equipment. His first breakthrough was a resin-like material he called Novolac, made by combining formaldehyde with phenol, a byproduct of coal gas production. Unfortunately, it proved too susceptible to heat for use as an electrical insulator, though similar resins are still used today as photoresist for making electronic circuit boards. Eventually, Bikeline made a breakthrough by subjecting Novolac to high heat and pressure in a pressure cooker-like device he called the Bakelizer. This produced a hard brown substance that was impervious to heat and solvents and an excellent electrical insulator dubbed the material of a thousand uses. The substance quickly dubbed Bakelite sparked a revolution in industrial design, being used on countless products including radio and telephone cases. Unlike celluloid, Bakelite was a thermosetting plastic, meaning that once molded and cured, it could not be remelted and remolded. This made Bakelite products very durable, such that many surviving pieces still look brand new. As the oil and gas industry continued to expand and chemists' understanding of polymer chemistry steadily improved, a parade of ever more useful and versatile plastics began to emerge from research laboratories, such as polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, in 1912, polymethyl methacrylate, or plexiglass, in 1924, polyurethane, in 1937, polyesterine, and polytetrafluorethylene, aka Teflon, in 1938 nylon in 1939, and polyethylene in 1941. The outbreak of the Second World War caused development of these materials to skyrocket, with plastic production nearly quadrupling from 213 million pounds in 1939 to 818 million pounds in 1945. Plastics found their way into all manner of military equipment, from nylon and parachutes to plexiglass and aircraft canopies, and Teflon in the secret enrichment plants that produce uranium for the first atomic bombs. After the war, the newly affluent global consumer economy took to plastic with wild abandon, with over 25 million tons of plastic being produced worldwide between 1950 and 1970 alone. Today, that number is over 400 million tons, with much of this production being centered in China. In the end, the plastics revolution was not the creation of a single person, but rather the result of countless incremental developments over nearly a century and a half. And while plastics have changed the lives of billions of people for the better, permitting technological advancements that would have been impossible with traditional materials, there can be too much of a good thing. Most plastics degrade very slowly, causing them to persist in the environment for decades, while the byproducts of their manufacture are often toxic and persistent environmental pollutants. One possible solution that has been experimented with in recent years is to create biodegradable plastics derived from natural materials like soy or potato starch. Given that the age of plastics began with similarly adapted materials like blood, milk, and cellulose, it would appear that 150 years later we have finally come full circle. Speaking of inventing things, the safety pin, which might not sound like a very interesting origin story, but it turns out, given it was invented by one of the greatest inventors in history that almost no one has heard of, it's worth a watch. Check it out in the video here.